Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. Dan, seldom does a book's title intrigue me more than, quote, The Salesman Who Doesn't Sell, A Marketing Guide for Making Money While You Sleep. We had to have Brian Greenfield come on the program. He's here now to tell us more. Brian, tell us first a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your book, and your website. Of course. Um, I've been selling online for the last 15 years, so... You know, I was, I guess, one of the one of the uh, first people to get into selling online. I have a lot of experience in SEO and internet marketing. Uh, I've had businesses that have been going on for 15 years, and they've been growing in success over that time. I also had an internet marketing company that was very successful uh, that I later sold. Uh, my main business right now is an online insurance agency, True Blue Life Insurance. Uh, it's you know it's a really great industry it's you know it's helping people and also there's a lot of uh money to be made in it it's one of the things that i could rank for on google uh that has a really big return if i could rank organically because uh the google pay per click for all the insurance keywords are usually $30 plus a click so i wanted to write the book because i wanted to teach people how to sell and how to leverage their reputation online. Because what I've been able to do is get people to start the buying process and then finish the entire process online without being pushy, with just being kind of an informational sales process, and get them through the whole process, and you don't even have to talk to them. So that's why I named the book uh, A Marketing Guide to Selling While You Sleep. Hmm. And your website? Uh, TrueBlueLifeInsurance.com. Uh, the book I'm actually giving the book, the audio book away for free, and it's TrueBlueLifeInsurance.com/book. And I'd love people just to go in there and uh, see all the steps and the outlines on exactly how I do it. Uh, I want people to to know how to get started in selling online without. You know, without getting ripped off by people, because I've I've been through the ringer. I've I've done business with everybody, uh, and I want people to not have a bad experience. I want them to to leverage the internet and to enjoy it and to use it to grow their business. Oh, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you because I I've, I have a hunch you've got a lot of questions. Well, I thank you, uh, Brian. Welcome to the program. Um, uh, I uh, I have to tell you, in listening in the brief discussion that you had with Don, um, and I don't want to come across as sounding like an idiot, but a light bulb just went off in my brain. Um, and I, I, what you were saying was exactly what I was doing, except I didn't realize I was doing it. Um, I have a I'm an author. I have a new book out that's been out about three weeks into a marketing campaign. And uh, it's, a, it's a thriller based on uh, terrorism. And um, it's been out three weeks, and it crossed 200,000 page views this morning in three weeks. Very good. And I, the, the, the publisher can't believe what's going on. But what, what struck me about what you said was is that when I go to bed at night, I literally look at how many page views and how many clicks I've gotten. And when I, one of the first things I do when I get up in the morning is I go to the website and I look and see how many page views I've gotten and how many clicks while I was sleeping. Right. And, and um, it's amazing uh, the number of people that, while I'm sleeping, are out 
looking at my book or, or clicking onto Amazon to buy the book. So um, it really has changed my whole um, persona in the sense that when I my first three books were available on Amazon, and um, and I I never thought about doing marketing of the of the stories, and I put two new books on marketing campaigns, one on dementia for a book on dementia for small children, and it got 160,000 hits in in eight weeks, and then this book came out and it just took off, and it dawned on me that that I had 200,000 people who have taken a page view at my book. It's 200,000 people, whether they like it or not, have seen my face and my brand. Uh, I, there's no way as doing book tours that I could ever see 200,000 people and survive and live to, to talk about it. So I am absolutely thankful for you for opening my brain to tell me that you are, I am in fact a follower and didn't know it at the time that I am marketing while I sleep. And I, oh, I, I just an amazing, amazing concept. Um, and so, um, how, when you think about your, what you're doing now with insurance, um, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you deal with primarily life insurance. Yes. Okay. So um, we had another guest on the program today, and I was we were talking about uh, money lasting, and I said. There is a futurist who's now saying that all major diseases will be curable by the year 2030, which means our longevity is going to dramatically skyrocket. So what does that do for the life insurance business in terms of if there are significant changes in mortality? Well, uh, the insurance companies will actually make more money because they don't have to pay out those claims. So the longer people live, long the better. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, insurance, it is insurance. You know, you want to get in case something happens unexpected. You know, if you're under 55, mm-hmm. the number one cause of death is an accident. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, there's, there's still a lot of diseases out there. And, you know, when you have a family, when you have kids and you have dependents, uh, that insurance, it helps you sleep better at night. You know, there's, there's, mm-hmm. it's one of the most important part of financial planning when you have a family. So, Peace you of know, mind. I, Absolutely, peace of mind. We get a lot of people that get approved and they finally, you know, get the insurance policy and they say it's like a weight being lifted off their shoulders. Yeah, I've been involved you know, just, in the financial service business for almost 45 years, and I cut my teeth early on as an agent for the Nationwide Insurance Company in Columbus, Ohio. And I, I, I know that it used to be that selling life insurance was not only a lucrative job, it was also a very difficult job. And there, there were a lot of no's before you got yeses. But, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you seem to say that with your marketing strategy on the Internet that some of those challenges have disappeared? Uh, that's exactly right, right. Uh, so the only people that will come to my site are the people that are looking for life insurance. You know, a lot of people go online just to run quotes. And what I've done is I've built my own quote engine, and people can go on and, and you know, view the rates of over 60 companies. Uh, I get reviews from just a ton of customers, uh, and they can do all the research. So by the time, you know, look, I could even sell policies without talking to anybody, and they don't even have to talk to an agent because insurance companies are beginning to take all the applications completely online. But yeah, you know, it's it's a lot easier for us because by the time you know they talk to an agent or they come to my company, they just want to, you know, they just want the application to be taken. They don't have many questions and and they they don't have to be sold. And that's one of the things I believe in, especially in insurance, is that insurance should be bought and not sold. At least it's a lot easier on my end to do it that way. Yeah, there there are there are people when I started in the business who used to say that life insurance is sold, it's not bought. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying is that life insurance now is bought, it's not sold. Um, with 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 the 
the industry building a business model that that was based on an agent talking to the customer, identifying needs, trying to figure out how much money. Um, have you, in effect, replaced the agency? And what kind of challenges do you have regulatorily uh, because it's a highly regulated business of selling just online? You know, we haven't gotten rid of the agent, and I don't foresee that the agent will go away. Uh you know, even when uh, a person goes through and they decide, you know, they want to buy a policy from, you know, Banner Life Insurance Company, they still mm -hmm. benefit from talking to an agent because, look, the, the, the applications for insurance are very long. Uh, mm -hmm. They get very private. And the other thing is when I get an agent taking the application, there's many times, 50% of the times, they'll be taking the application and they'll answer a question whether it be family history or blood pressure, diabetes, something that comes up where we're, we'll want to put them in a different policy. So that's the huge benefit of having really good, experienced agents. Now, my agents aren't selling per se. You know, they're, they're more serving. They're more customer service. They're more advising. Uh, though the insurance companies are so diverse in how they underwrite and you know, there's not just one company that's great for everybody. That's why uh, the insurance agent is important. And look, life insurance is something that you're going to be paying for monthly for 20 years. You want to make sure you get the best deal on it. It's not good mentally so, to be to know that you're overpaying for so long. Now, if 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 we go back in time, uh, the agency force the compensation on uh, life insurance premiums is a, a significant percentage of the first year and perhaps maybe a second year premium. How, how do you, you say you have agents. Um, um, why do they, why do those agents want to work for you? I pay my agents primarily a salary. Uh, I do pay them a small commission. But the commission's not enough, you know, the agents, they're not the hungry agents that have to sell uh, in order to eat, all right? Uh, I pay them a large salary. So the other thing is, look, uh, as far as if you're an insurance agent, you know, working for a company like mine is, is kind of like a dream job, all right? You're only dealing with people that want to buy your product. And that's a big change from a lot of the agents that have to go door to door and knock on 50 people and get 49 notes. It's a nice mm -hmm. thing. And it, I've turned it into uh, a very service oriented business. And uh, it's working. You know, we have like, oh, I think, over 180 better business reviews that are all five star. And, uh, you know, it's, it's driving my business. That's another thing I want to bring up is reviews. So when people go to my website and they, you know, buying a life insurance policy is a big thing, they'll look at the reviews and they'll see True Blue Life Insurance has hundreds of reviews on third-party websites that I don't even control. And that can be a deciding factor that can sway somebody into buying from me rather than a local agent, rather than calling the company directly. And it could work for any business wow. is what I'm saying. Yeah. I did write the book. Uh, because I have other businesses. So, uh, you know, I have several e-commerce businesses and I've done consulting. Uh, I want to let people know how they can do it. That, you know, people that want to increase their business but don't like pushy sales, there is another way. And you can sell online by being a good guy and being honest and transparent. And it's a wonderful thing because you can answer all the questions someone could have on any business and get them through the whole sales process while you sleep, if you if you want to say something like that. So I, I want to follow up what you're saying and ask and ask you a question. What would you what would you say to some of our listeners? We are a small business. We're a small business uh, show who are contemplating uh, changing their business model from a direct sales representation model to the Internet, what would you say are the opportunities, but also what are the challenges and the pitfalls of trying to do that? 
I think you know what you're asking me is you have, you have a, a, a sales process. So I'd imagine your sales process, you, you need to talk to the people. The question I would ask you is, what questions are people asking? Is it possible to give your whole sales process, your whole sales pitch, and deliver it online? Everything from pricing, everything from return policies, everything from deliverables, uh, the steps that you're going to bring customers through. If you could answer all those questions and then back it up by building trust and building their confidence in you, especially with past, past results, past clients, give them all the references, and then the reviews. I want to emphasize the reviews because they are tremendously powerful. Uh, it's driven businesses like Amazon. They drive my business. Uh, people trust online reviews. So if you put 10 reviews of customers that people can look at and they, they believe they, and they can verify it, it's a huge, it's a huge swaying point for customers. Well, I noticed that Amazon, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in some of the product areas where there's a review, they will um, verify that this particular person mm -hmm. may have purchased the product or service so that I, I guess what you're saying is that they, that's the way they, they prove that there is uh, integrity, that the, the, the people actually did buy the product that they're reviewing. A little bit. My, I have a different process, and, and that's, that's a review that Amazon controls, all right? And I, I recommend that to everybody. So whenever you have a client, I, I send them a, uh, you know, a review form, usually via email, using a software service like MailChimp or ActiveCampaign, and I'll have them give me star reviews and comments. Now, those are reviews that you can control, you can decide whether to place them on your website. Amazon decides to place them on their website or not. Verified buyer, you know, that's a tricky question because, you know, uh, people do buy Amazon reviews. What I like to do is when you get somebody who gives you a five-star review, you then go back and you ask that customer to give the same review on a site that you don't control, such as Yelp such as Google Business Pages, such as the Better Business Bureau, if you're in the hospitality business, TripAdvisor. Those review sites carry much more weight because you do not control them. You, you don't have the choice. If someone gives you a bad review, you can't take it down. That's true. Very true. What we found, what we found is, and we've done numerous focus groups, and we follow people on our website, and we've done this for years. The last thing somebody will do before they call, they take an action for a sale, is they'll look you up online. And they'll look up your name and followed by review or followed by complaint or followed by scam. They want to make sure that you're legitimate and accountable. And they want to see somebody else that had a positive experience, and then they can make the decision of the odds that they're going to have a positive experience too. And people want recourse. So if it doesn't go well, they want to know that that person cares about their online reputation. Which meaning if you get, you know, if you can give someone a bad review, uh it's not good for their business, their career, or anything. And they'll do pretty much anything to make sure you take down that review. Is is as a person who is uh, this is my word, uh, 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 not yours, a founder of Internet marketing. Um, do you see um, a major void which creates an opportunity, that, that, a need that's not being exploited on the Internet today? Or am I asking you to give away a trade secret? <laughs> a major void. Yeah. Um, if I'm thinking about if I'm thinking about wanting to do something, I, I want to have some idea. I don't want to go in and have to try and compete with seven thousand people, but if there is a particular area of of whether it's consumer products or insurance or whatever uh, that is not being met, I mean maybe everything is being met. I I I don't believe that, but I suppose that's possible. But I'm I'm just curious as to. Uh, is there an untapped area 
uh, of the internet that that is not being exploited uh, that it could be in the next major growth area for the internet for somebody who's looking to start a business. Well, I think a lot of industries that you know are customer or are service focused. Let's say accounting. You know, accounting. You know, you have H and R Block, but now you have TurboTax. You have mortgages, right? Now you have Lending Tree or Rocket Mortgage. Uh, insurance. You have you have Select Quote and you have True Blue Life Insurance that you can buy online. So I think any business that you know is traditionally you have to have someone come into the office or they have to go to your home uh, opens the door for technology to make it easier. So I, I'm not really saying pe- what to go into business uh, or what what you know what profession to go into. I just want to teach people how to separate yourself from all the other competition. So when so that they will find you, so that when they do find you, you can convert them into a customer. And that's the most important yeah. thing because I, I have I have a hundred thousand different competitors selling life insurance online, although sure. I'm beating all of them. I'm beating all of them by using techniques such as reviews and demonstrating social proof and giving things away, you know, theory of reciprocity. There's so many different things you can do. Um, and making sure that I can answer all their questions. All my competitors, you know, they, they don't answer all the questions. They leave 10 questions unanswered, which means it just sends a customer to, to your competitor. Right. If you if you could uh, take a moment and, and think about um... – Somebody giving advice to somebody today uh, who's who's thinking about uh, starting up an internet business for selling widgets. What, what are some of the things that you've learned over your career of starting many businesses on the internet? What are some of the things that that you learned that they could shortcut by listening to you? The one thing I like to do is whenever. You know, I outline in the book, you know, all the different phases to start a website. You know, you have your designers, you have your programmers, uh, and there's a lot of different pieces, the merchant accounts, everything. Now, what I always recommend and what I do is I hire freelancers, okay? There's several freelancer sites that are available now that are new industries, freelancer.com, upwork.com. Now, what you can do is you can post the project. You can say, I want to build a website to sell widgets. Um, what you find is people will bid on it. They'll say, you know, I'll do it for 250 I'll do it for 500 Whatever it is, people bid on it. Now, these freelancers, they build their careers on building up reviews on these freelancer websites. So you can bid out a project, and they will over-deliver. So that's a great way to get started, and it's a great way not to be taken advantage of because these third-party websites – for the freelancers, they act as an intermediary. All right, so you don't pay the freelancer directly; you pay the freelancer website. So if there's a dispute, they get in the middle of it, and that's one of the worst things about getting into the online or internet business is that you don't know who to trust, and so many people uh, will overcharge you, or they'll do things that uh, don't work out for you, and you'll end up overspending. So the same. The techniques I use to, uh, you know, sell people without selling are the same things that I want people to, to use when choosing who to hire to build to get you into the business. Now, just doing those is just going to save you a tremendous amount of time, heartache, and money. If you go to an, a large agency, they, you know, you say, I want to build a website, they might say it'll cost $30,000. They have 15 employees and a big office space, you know, to pay the rent for freelancer these guys are competing they're competing against each other it's a much different marketplace and you can get the same website built for a thousand dollars arguably just as good that's my main advice for people looking to get into selling online your book etc it's truebluelifeinsurance.com slash book and I give away all the recommendations of the best products, the best software, the best services. Uh, you know, if somebody does want to go online and sell widgets, I want to make sure that uh, they don't—they they have an easy time doing it and they can protect themselves. 
and they get started on the internet and they do the right things for the least amount of money. And then you get to go one more question. We're running out of time. I, I'm, I know, I've been fascinated, I absolutely fascinated by what Brian, Brian said, said. And I had mm-hmm. questions, but you, you keep uh, developing better ones. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me. Uh, we, we do uh, two shows a week. We do two guests on every show. We've done over 100 guests, maybe 105, 110 guests in the last year. How many of these people that we're talking to are startup businesses on the Internet? They have chosen not to go the brick-and-mortar route. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I, I, I'm wondering, is, is it got to the point? Do you believe that it's, it's become too much risk to consider brick-and-mortar anymore? You, you're almost forced to have to go to the Internet to open a business? Brick and mortar is still a necessity. It's expensive. If you want to open up a brick and mortar store, you know, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're looking at a lot. To get started to selling online could be a couple hundred dollars. So the barriers to entry are much lower. Now, it's important, though. Anyone with a brick and mortar store business, they're missing out tremendously if they're not also marketing online. So Anyone with a physical brick-and-mortar store should be taking advantage of every way they can possible online to automate their their business, to bring in new customers. It's a huge opportunity. Thank you. Don, back to you. Well, uh, Brian, uh, it's been a a fascinating uh, time with you. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, And your book again? It's The Salesman Who Doesn't Sell. A marketing guide to selling while you sleep. Well, uh, I don't know what to say. I've just I've been listening and uh, realizing how some of the things I've been doing in the past are wrong. But uh, like Dan, it's nice to know uh, we're on the right track again. But uh, thank you, Brian, for being with us. Hey, thank you very much, Don and Dan, for having me. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your small business tip of the day. Have you ever worked really hard to land an order only to find out that you lost it? There are times where we really want an order from a prospective client. And then you find out after all your hard work, the order went to a competitor. We learn wisdom from our failures much more than from our successes. It still hurts to lose the order, but losing an order teaches us a great deal about what kind of business person we really are. So here's your Recalculating.biz small business tip of the day. When you find out that you lost the order, don't send an email. Send a letter to the head of the business unit that placed the order. Tell that person that you are disappointed that you didn't get the order, but that you'll work even harder to get the next one. Ask him to tell you what you can do so the next time the order's in play, you can win it.
This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz Small Business Tip of the Day. Welcome back to Recalculating, the program dedicated to American small business. Now, Dan Perkins and Don Mazella. Dan, do you run your business or does it run you? Sometimes we don't know. What Al Zenick, author of the upcoming book, Master Your Cash Flow, The Key to Grow a Valuable Business, says a small says a small business leader needs to run his or her company. He tells us why now. Al, welcome to the program. Uh, Don, great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, uh, uh, having had read your first book, I'm, I'm really anxious to I'm looking forward to the second. Um, but for, but first, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your book, and what you, what do you mean by what I said? Okay, well, uh, again, my name is Al Zanuck. I'm the president and CEO of Trail Solace Wealth Management in New York City. I'm, I'm a CPA, a personal financial specialist, and uh, I've been the author of a, a book that came out last year, Master Your Cash Flow, The Key to Grow and Retain uh, Wealth. And I'm coming out with a new book uh, sometime in mid-year called Master Cash Flow, The Key to Grow a Valuable Business. And what I'm after is basically to uh, – I'm out to help businesses that, uh, especially when they first start, they find a struggle in time, is, is to give them the highest probability of, of being successful and not uh, winding up like, um, like the Department of Labor says that – uh, at least uh, two thirds of both businesses are not around in ten years. I like to have them have a better chance. Well, that's a laudable thought. But first, before we go further, what's your website? Uh, my website is uh, alzanek, uh, a l z d e n e k dot com. I'm glad you spelled it out um, for, for people. Now, ha- having said that, I guess uh, my, my first question, uh, question is. Um, you know, I've been running a business for a long time, and when I when I read your first book and and I looked at your second, you, you're absolutely right about cash flow. But but how do people focus on cash flow? Well, I think that uh, a new business person, and I count myself in this uh, 30 years ago, is that you know uh, you basically uh, look at your cash flow this way: uh, is there enough cash in the checking account? And as long as there's enough cash in the checking account, uh, you figure you're okay. Um, but like my, like most businesses 30 years ago, I got myself in trouble because even though I had cash in the checking account, I had bills mounting up here, I had accounts receivable I wasn't collecting, and pretty soon, even though uh, my business w- w- had been, quote, successful in being around for a while, I found myself on the ropes cash flow-wise because while I was out there getting a business, selling it, I wasn't looking at expenses, I wasn't managing, and I wasn't targeting what I wanted to earn. So I think, uh, I think getting back to looking at your cash flow and targeting it and understanding how you can better manage it are keys to initial uh, new businesses, but also ones that have been around for a while. Well, uh, I agree with you. You know, uh, someone once gave me a, a T-shirt that read, I can't be out of cash, I still have checks. And I've <laughs> worn that for many years. Um, but uh, I'm going to go ask one more question and turn it over to Dan. But, okay. Okay, having said all that, what's the first thing a, a small business owner should do uh, to focus on uh, cash flow? Well, uh, I think that... Um the first thing a, a business owner should do, whether new or been or been around a while, is uh, look at, you know, it may sound simple, but look at how much you want to earn. How much are you targeting? Uh, most businesses are very bad at not setting clear targets. Uh, and if you don't set clear, clear targets, whether it's the sales you want, the bottom line, or cash flow, it's kind of hard to, to make uh, adjustments or know that you have to make adjustments to uh, to your business, and and then so you do that by basically and again most business owners don't do it initially, but you uh, use a you know if you have to take a, a blank sheet of paper and every month list down all your expenses 
and what cash came in and did was cash better than your expenses, that's a rudimentary way of at least seeing that you're covering your cost and making some profit. And then if you can take that system of every month doing that and say, you know, I'm going to look now the next three months or six months and see that if I can forecast that. See, you know, if I can see, like, by the sixth month, I'm going to be bringing in X amount of money, and these are my expenses, and this is my profit. Uh, if you start doing that, then basically you have a chance to start uh, setting some clear targets. And, and the thing is, once you have a target out there, like I want to earn that in six months or a year, uh, like this is what my sales should be, this is what my expenses should be, and this is what I want to earn, then what you can do along the way, you can track it. You know, it's sort of like a, having, it's sort of like taking care of your own health. You know, it, let's say you want to improve your health a bit. And so you say, you know, I, I weigh so much, I want to lose not 10, 20 pounds. And I think I'm going to uh, walk a little bit, I'm going to swim a little bit, or whatever. And so you start saying, well, if I, if, if I do this two or three days a week, and I watch my weight every week or, or every, every month, um, you know, am I on track? It's the same thing with a business. You know, you just had a health plan, you start to put together a business plan except that you're just aiming for, for different things. And then once you put it together, then at the end of each month you say, gee, am I, am I on target? And if I'm not on target, why not? And, and then, then after that, you start looking at, okay, if I'm not on target, what can I change to be on target? Like if I didn't lose enough weight, what else can I do to be on target? So uh, basically it's a matter of setting goals. It's a matter of then when you set a goal, tracking it, and then, and then what I call you, and then you pivot. If, if one thing's not working, you try something else because the whole thing is still to, to really uh, achieve that target, whether it's sales, uh, profit, or cash flow. That was a lot. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dan. <laughs> thank you, Don. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us out. Dan, it's my, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, I, I am. Uh, a registered investment advisor. I've been in the business for almost 45 years. Uh, worked with a lot of uh, small entrepreneurial clients, and uh, and uh, so I, I understand. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, one of the things that I, in, when I started my business many many decades ago, when I was working on Wall Street, I I said to my wife, you know, I think we have enough money in the bank that we can not change our lifestyle for at least two years. Hmm. And if I, can't make, if I can't make a go of it in two years, then I'll go back to working for where I know I can get a job at Merrill Lynch or any of the wirehouse firms. And so my um, uh, cash flow is, is so important because um, getting that customer and understanding, especially as a small business, the value of the income that that customer can generate uh, is I believe woefully underestimated in people who are starting up new businesses. Uh, I have to agree with that. I, I think that they don't understand the effect, the building effect of pleasing one customer, and then having multiple things to sell that customer. But the expansion of that customer is going to tell someone else. You, uh, I, I agree with you totally. Yeah, you know, um, cash flow uh, is a strategy that I've used for 45 years in helping my clients manage money. Uh, and if you, if you look at the, the total return of the equity markets over the last 100 years, over 65% of the return in the markets came from dividends, not from appreciation. Appreciation mm -hmm. was less than the, than the value of cash flow. And so how do you help people understand the, the for somebody like you or me or Don who – who understands it that cash flow is so important how do you how do you drive the point home that that you can get people's eyes open to it well you know that's very good uh, Dan uh, and I think that um, I appreciate your appreciation of cash flow we both are speaking the same language here how I do it is this I, I basically sit down with them and uh, and maybe I'll show them something like you know if you had if you had maybe um, bought a car versus leased it, how much more cash flow is one saving versus another? And let's say it's only as much as maybe like a few hundred dollars a month. 
what you do is show them, well, that may be three or four thousand a year. And over the life of the right. lease, if it's three or five years, that's twenty thousand or whatever. And then gee, if you compound right. that for the next thirty or forty, that could be that little decision there could actually be almost a million dollar decision. And and I think when people see that the, some of the some of the decisions they make on a daily basis, whether it's buy or lease a car or equipment, whether it's basically how should I make that advertisement or not, or other things like or that sale, can I sell more to that customer? And you equate it down to well, what effect does it have over the next ten, twenty, thirty, forty years? I think it's a real eye opener for people. Yeah. I'm I'm reminded of a story from my uh one of my sons who uh uh told us two weeks ago that he's buying another house. And um and I said to him, So why did you decide to buy this house and move out of the apartment? And he said you know what he said to me? He said, Well, Dad, I have never made a profit in real estate and I, I just trying to figure out how much I lose on this one. Um <laughs> He says, my timing in real estate has been the worst. I have never – I had some friends who were – was uh, uh, here on Sanibel who was the COO of a very of a Fortune 500 company and was – and transferred all over the world. He said they have never made money on any, any house they've ever owned in their entire life because they always bought at the high and were forced to sell because they had to move at the low. And so I, I think that, that the other thing that I think it, it, it might be helpful to our listeners is why cash flow is important is that cash flow creates the ability to set aside a reserve. And by setting aside a reserve, you can put it to work in a retirement account or brokerage account or savings account so that when you make a miscalculation, you have money to fall back on. Um, and you don't have you're not you're not destitute. Well, and, I have to agree uh, with you. I, I think that the way I look at it, if you have enough cash flow to cover the way you want to live, you are financially you're financially independent. Most mm-hmm. people don't have that, especially if they quit their job. So how do you get enough assets so that those assets earn money, like send checks to you in dividends and interest and whatever? so that you Mm -hmm. someday can have that amount of cash flow, inflation adjusted for the future years, that now you can can now have the option of working or not, or having your business or not. And then if you do that calculation, then the nice thing, the one thing that always um, has thrilled me in uh, helping people is that, okay, if you know that, and you know how much you have to save to get there by age 60 or 65, what kind of decisions can you make now or somewhere along the way that can accelerate that? Like, like for example, uh, can, uh, is it something around debt? Is it if you're a business owner, if you open up another office uh, or whatever, if you can now somehow find more cash flow than what you had to save, what you do, you can accelerate when you get to where you're financially independent or you have m- more wealth. So I think yeah. that becomes a game, too, not only with the cash flow, but what can you do to accelerate it? So let's let's take your book, since it's not quite out yet. Uh, how do you think your the changes in the new tax law that went into effect in January, uh, how does your book, uh, uh, does it address the changes in the tax law? And as a strategy, as somebody advising business people, have the tax law changes cause you to change your mind about strategies that you're talking to people who are trying to build businesses? Well, that's the first question. Uh, taxes are taxes. Uh, they're going to be taxes 10 years from now, 5, 50 years from now. So we don't address specifically the tax law change. We address the fact that you should always have strategies that are saving taxes. And why do you want to do that? Why do you want to fill up your 401k? Why do you want to have a cash balance for a pension plan? Because you're saving taxes, and the government is helping you accelerate your wealth so that you can get to your retirement goals sooner or with more, more money. Now, that said, um, you know, you know um, what we do encourage is people to, rather than specifically talk about pass-through entities or whatever, is we tell them that, 
you know, most people do, are not sophisticated in taxes. They may be able to file a simple 1040, but what they really need is a really good partner with them. And I say partner in the sense that someone to work with, like a really good CPA. And as part of what I call their championship team of experts, surround yourself with good experts. And, and the CPA is one of those. And, and one of the things we really pound in our book is that most CPAs are there when you call them up. And they're there when you drop off your information in February or March. And a lot of them, especially for business owners, uh, they'll call them up on April 10th or whatever and say your return is finished and now you own five, ten, or 15000 Or they don't guide them along. So what we, we rather than talk about the tax law itself, we talk about how to get someone that's going to help you tax-wise, that's going to be proactive, that you're going to sit every quarter with, or at least – at least by December of every year, you have a tax projection of what your return looks like so that you manage your cash flow if there's going to be surprises in April, or basically so you don't have to be surprised in April. Plus, if you do force your account, and if you get a good one that understands what you need by having a projection done before the end of the year, then you have time to really take advantage of more deductions and pay the least amount of tax rather than you're, you're sitting down with your account in February for the year before, and you can do nothing about that. Right. Good point. Good point. So, so to me, you, it's like using all your professionals that way. Tell them, you know, basically, this is what I need, and basically making sure that they're proactive with you. I, do you think Dan, that, I have to just... Jump in here, and so uh, uh, that's a particular point with me. I've had the same. I hadn't realized, but do you know I've had the same accountant for 38 years? Uh, and wow. uh, it, it, exactly what you say is what he does. We started out young together, and uh, as he says, we're growing old together. But um, and, and you know, and the other thing uh, I learned is you never lie to your accountant or your attorney. About anything. Uh, that's right, but 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 you know, but uh, but Don, the biggie pack on you. If if my, in my first book, the last chapter is create a team, a, a championship team of experts. And by the way, that doesn't mean the most expensive. They that those are the ones that basically like your CPA. They meet you before the end of the year. They're proactive. When was the last time you heard from from your insurance agent? Most uh, most times, they just said it and forget it. Um, you know, you want to be able to have a per- people around you that know your business or career, and you have to tell them this is what I expect from you. And if they don't, if they don't, uh, if they don't live up to the to being a good player, you you, you replace them. I always have a story. Uh, I'm I'm from I'm originally from from Philadelphia, even though I live in New York now. So, so I'm a Philadelphia Phillies fan. But you know what? When I was in when the team in the 70s and 80s, whatever, you know. The Yankees, I always look to the Yankees, and George Steinbrenner, every year for 26 years, fielded a competitive team. They maybe not won the championship every year, but they were, in, they were competitive in the playoffs. Well, and the Phillies just weren't. It's because Steinbrenner always demanded the best players. If you don't have the best players around you, they're like a ball and chain. They're, they're going to they're, they're gonna drag you to work harder and longer in life or have less. So, so get yourself a good team. That's a very good uh, point. I'm sorry to jump in, Dan, but I had to. Back to you. No problem. Yeah, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so it's it's um, the the team is very important. I, I, I as as I have built my practice over the years, um, it's it's been kind of like a bell curve. Early on in the in the late uh, 80s, I was building the practice and and continued to build it into the 90s and the 2000s. And then, as people retired and, and started, we changed my practice. But um, you know, it's it's interesting. I would love to have your perspective on how difficult it it might be for some people, myself included, to ever retire. And so they're going to well, have to be doing something forever. Well, I, you know, we all, I think we all share the same uh, issue, I guess, because as an entrepreneur and someone who started a business, I love what I do. You guys, you both sound like you love what you do. And so, but don't we really want, as business owners or entrepreneurs, 
don't we really want to know that we don't have to work, but that we, it's, it's our choice? And I think that's important when you're looking at cash flow or planning with a person, is whether it's an executive or a business owner, someday they just want to walk into their office uh, or their store and know they don't have to be there. It's now their choice. And when it's your choice, there, there's less anxiety, less stress. And, now, and, you know, and so when you're building and when you keep on working after that in your business, it becomes fun. It becomes, you know, it's like I don't have to be here. So uh, I don't really look at retiring either, uh, and, uh, but I'm going to continue to have fun because I love what I do. You know, I think that's a, you, the last word. The last words you talked about, love what you do. I mean, I can, I, you know, I, I work in the area of uh, mental health and uh, and dementia. And uh, one of the, the common phrases, use it or lose it. You got to use your brain. And, and I, one of the things that I do with my clients when the, the, I was just with one last week, where the husband has been retired for a number of years and the wife is quite younger. And she's not going to retire. And I'm asking her, what are you going to do with your time? And she says, I don't know. And um, if you don't have something to do with your time, you are going to deteriorate. And, and I, I just think, um, I mean, I just heard a scary statistic. I don't know whether you heard this or not. But there's one of these futurists who's now predicting by the year 2030, that's only what? 12 years away, mm-hmm. he, he's saying that all major diseases will be curable. Okay, on, well. Let's hope he's right. Let's hope he's right. You know, I don't really care as much about diseases. The fact that, can, can I live longer? <laughs> yeah, and, and I, with the diseases, you probably will live longer. But then the question becomes, you know, there are people today who are retiring who are facing the reality, especially the baby boomers, that you might be in retirement for as long as you work full time. That's true. Yes. It's like another career. And, and, so uh, and I think uh, you're probably going the same direction. There's been a lot of uh, studies out there that show that people are going to outlive their money. Mm-hmm. No question. That's what the problem I have with the Social Security numbers is that the actual studies uh, that they've used to determine what the benefits should be it ain't going to hold up. It not, and we've, we've got, we got 10,000 senior, we've got 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for the next 16 years. Wow. I don't, I don't, I don't know how it's going to ha- handle it. But I, I think if people learned how to handle their cash flow and finances better, uh, and they really were taught better in our schools this, I think Social Security and things like that would be a second thought because they would be making good financial decisions all along the way and not have to get to the point where maybe one of the only things that they're depending on is their Social Security check. I used to uh, just want to make one more point, Don, and I'll give it back to you, what what our guest just said. I used to do a lot of seminars all over the country when I was running a product area for Merrill Lynch. And I used to ask people in the audience, the first question was, how many of you have um, a bachelor's degree? How many have a master's degree? How many have a Ph.D.? And all the hands would go up. Then I would say to them, and how many hours of credit did you get in college learning how to manage the money that your advanced degree was going to give you? Zero. None. Yes. So not only are we not teaching in the college, we're not teaching it in, in high schools. We don't teach people how to manage their success in terms of financially. Everybody does their own little thing, whatever it is. Anyway, back to you, Don. No, it's been so fascinating listening. To, uh, again, you, um, your book, and where people can get it, and your website. Sure, uh, sure, Don. Uh, again, my website is al, A-L, Zenek, Z-D-E-N-E-K dot com. Uh, my book that's out now is Master Cash Flow, uh, The Key to Grow and Retain Wealth. And you, that, you can get that by looking uh, by going to the, uh, the Amazon site and uh, get my book there. Uh, you can also go to my personal website uh, where you can be directed where to get the book. And also, there's a personal assessment there. There's about ten questions that we ask people uh, that maybe will uh, maybe spur some thought or give us some ideas on how to 
master their cash flow more. And then finally, I'm coming out with a new book later this year called Master Cash Flow, The Key to Grow a Valuable Business, which is going to be geared toward the businesses versus the first one geared toward individuals. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Tell me, Dan, uh, tell me about your latest book. My recent or my current book that's coming out, I should say, is uh, Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? And it's uh, it's really the first book written for children between the ages of 9 and 12 and their families uh, dealing with dementia. Dementia is a growing problem with the elderly in the United States and around the world. And we are very well, not very well informed about what's going on, what's happening. So I wrote this book in the form of a mystery. And I have two little girls, 9 and 12, who uh, have the magical power to be able to seem to be able to find things that are lost. And so they go to their dads and moms and they say, you know, we really, we, we, we work all over the neighborhood helping people find things. And we seem to find things. And their dad says, yes, you have a magical talent to do that. And they said, we'd like to start a business to see if we can help other people. So they decided to start a business. The two girls' name are Hudson and Charlotte. And they start H&C's Lost and Found. If you've lost it, we find it. And so they build a business, and they convince the dads to build them an office and a treehouse in the backyard. And uh, they get busy making posters and flyers trying to get customers. And their dads take them downtown, and they put them in the windows and on the telephone poles and light poles. And they go home, and uh, first week goes by, and nobody comes. And the second week and third week, and nobody comes. They're really, really dejected. And the fourth week comes, and... There's a knock at the door, and they walk over and open the door, and there's a young man standing there with one of their flyers in his hands. And he says to them, my dad says the reason why my Grammy can't remember me is because she's lost her memory. And your flyer says you find things that are lost. Can you find my Grammy's memory? Well, they don't know anything about memory, so they take his name and they go see their dads to see what can happen and the story evolves into how they learn about what dementia is and what's going on in the body when somebody has dementia. And then they decide, while well, they can't find their customer's memory, they can help him build the tools to retain her in his memory. And so at the end of the book, there are about 10, or 10 to 12, 13 things that families can do together to work on to preserve the memory of grandma and grandpa so the generations can know who these people were. And that's the story. What a great book. And when will it be available? And, um, and how can people get it? Well, it'll be available on amazon.com. A lot of people who have read it, uh, who've had moms and dads that have been stricken with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, tell me that they really now begin to understand what's happening in grandma's brain. And uh, we took a a different approach. Rather than do the typical brain cross-section, we design, I work with the artist, and we design highways in the brain. And there's a brain of one of the little girls and the brain of Grammy. They both have highways, roads, but the other girl's brain, everything is green and go. Grammy's brain is full of no left turns, do not enter, stop, no right turns. So all of the messages that need to come from our brain get screwed up and we can't function. Great illustrations, though. Wonderful illustrations. Well, say goodbye, Dan. All right. Time for us to go. Thank you for joining us. And, by the way, if you didn't hear all of today's show, you can go to recalculating.biz and you can pick up this show and past shows. Uh, to expand your knowledge as becoming more successful entrepreneurs. Thank you, thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. We've been asked recently by a number of people, how can they listen to past shows? And if you go to recalculating.biz, you'll find a link to iHeartRadio, which will allow you to go back and listen to shows that you didn't get a chance to finish or never heard. So we encourage you to go there, recalculating.biz. Ben, what do you have to say about today's guests and their ideas? 
Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful.